joining me today is Sherlock. <laughs> what a beauty he is. <laughs> he knows. <laughs> he is a cat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we do a foundation of all good qualities. So using it to set our motivation. The foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure guru. Correct devotion to him is the root of the path. By clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon them with great respect. Understanding that the precious freedom of this rebirth is found only once is greatly meaningful and is difficult to find again. Please bless me to generate the mind that unceasingly, day and night, takes its essence. This life is as impermanent as a water bubble. Remember how quickly it decays and death comes. After death, just like a shadow follows the body, the results of black and white karma follow. Finding firm and definite conviction in this, please bless me always to be careful, to abandon even the slightest negativities and accomplish all virtuous deeds. Seeking samsaric pleasures is the door to all suffering. They are uncertain and cannot be relied upon. Recognizing these shortcomings, please bless me to generate the strong wish for the bliss of liberation. Led by this pure thought, mindfulness, alertness, and great caution arise. The root of the teachings is keeping the Pradamoksha vows. Please bless me to accomplish this essential practice. Just as I have fallen into the sea of samsara, so of all mother migratory beings. Please bless me to see this, train in supreme bodhicitta, and bear the responsibility of freeing migratory beings. Even if I develop only bodhicitta, but I don't practice the three types of morality, I will not achieve enlightenment. With my clear recognition of this, please bless me to practice the bodhisattva vows with great energy. Once I have pacified distractions to wrong objects and correctly analyzed the meaning of reality, please bless me to generate quickly within my mind stream the unified path of calm abiding and special insight. Having become a pure vessel by training in the general path, please bless me to enter the holy gateway of the fortunate ones, the supreme Vajra vehicle. At that time, the basis of accomplishing the two attainments is keeping pure vows in Samaya. As I've become firmly convinced of this, please bless me to protect these vows and pledges like my life. Then, having realized the importance of the two stages, the essence of the Vajrayana, by practicing with great energy, never giving up the four sessions, please bless me to realize the teachings of the Holy Guru. Like that, may the gurus who show the noble path and the spiritual friends who practice it have long lives. Please bless me to pacify completely all outer and inner hindrances. In all my lives, never separated from perfect gurus, may I enjoy the magnificent Dharma. By completing the qualities of the stages and paths, may I quickly attain the state of Vajradhara. And just sitting with that. And what is the four sessions? Four meditation sessions. So when you're in retreat, um, uh, we try and work in those ways. The, the three moralities? Um, the, it's from the ethics section of um, the six perfections. So the ethics of um, doing positive actions, refraining from negative actions, and benefiting sentient beings. The three types of morality. Welcome. So we're on um, just the first verse, basically, right? We're just on um, the foundation of all good qualities is the kind and perfect pure guru. Correct devotion to him is the root of the path. By clearly seeing this and applying great effort, please bless me to rely upon him with great respect. So that very first verse is the very first section of kind of the official Lom Rim topics. So what we were doing before was a little bit of history, which is built into the Lom Rim itself. Talking a little bit about the greatness of the authors, um, given to show the teachings has an immaculate source, the greatness of the Dharma, 
given to increase one's respect, how to listen and teach the Dharma, and then the sequence in which the disciples are actually taught, and then we get the root of the path devotion to a spiritual guide. So this section here, we didn't talk about as much because we've talked about it a lot in the past, um, the way to listen and the way to teach and what things the teacher should do. Do you want to go through that section or does it feel pretty clear to you? Like um, it was the section about like the three faults of the vessel. Remember not being a upside down pot or a leaky pot or a poisoned pot. Do you remember that way back? And having the six ideas like that you are the sick person and the Dharma is the medicine. It was that whole kind of section. When you shift over into who, how to teach the Dharma, intuitively what comes to you, how do you teach the Dharma? Or to whom do you teach the Dharma? I'm not a Vajra teacher. I don't give tantric empowerments. I have very few actual students that I've made that formal relationship with, where we've checked each other out for many years, they've asked, I've accepted. There are very few people who are actually my, like, students, <laughs> you know. I have lots of Dharma friends who I explain Dharma to, and then they could explain Dharma to me um, from a different perspective. Um, but this is talking both in terms of like capital T teachers, as well as teaching in general. And the, the thing we always want to remember, which is advice for anyone instructing anyone about anything is you teach when you're asked, <laughs> right? So you have to be requested who to teach, how to teach when you're requested, right? So um, it's basically like an advice against unsolicited advice. And why? Because it's not skillful. You know, how often have we heard advice from people that we did not ask for, <laughs> you know, and we thought, oh, I didn't ask for that, but that's so useful. Thank you so much. Like very rarely, you know, even if it's good advice, even if it's specific to our life, if we're not open to it, it feels intrusive, you know, or it feels judgmental or it feels patronizing or, it's just there's no time or space for it, right? So <clears throat> when you're teaching the Dharma, it's so valuable, so sacred. And, you know, we could call Dharma any number of things. It doesn't have to be Buddhist Dharma. But we don't want to be teaching unless we're asked, meaning there has to be an opening. You know, if it's this precious wisdom that you've come to, that you've studied, that you've understood, that you've integrated to a certain degree, and this precious thing... Do you want to just kind of like share it willy nilly? You know, there's some sort of quote from the Bible that's coming into my head about, you know, don't throw your pearls before swine, which is a terrible sort of harsh statement. But it's, it's basically saying if you have something precious, make sure who you're giving it to actually can receive it. Hard to know, but um, it's important to be requested. So that was the, that's the essence of that section. And we can take that whether we're technical teachers or not, because we're all in a leadership role somewhere in our life. Um, what, do you, what do you think about that premise? I think it's very important, especially when you're talking Buddhism uh, with people that are not exposed to this uh, and you start to lecture, especially uh, things concerning karma, etc. it become a big hassle. So by experience, I know it's a mistake. Yeah, it's, it's like, uh, you know, someone is on a new diet and it's working so well and then they're telling everyone about their new diet and people are like, I'm living my life. I don't care about your diet. Yay, I'm glad you're healthy, but go away. Doesn't mean that your diet doesn't work and that it's not useful, but it's like, if they're not in the mood to hear it, don't force feed it to them. Um, yeah, it's, it's an interesting one because also the other side of that is requesting a teaching creates the cause to meet teachings. So there's a tradition in Buddhism where we request teachings, even if we know there's not really time, space, opportunity for it to happen immediately. Just the mental action, the karma created of requesting 
and verbally and you know maybe writing a letter this creates the merit we need to actually access and connect the teachings so um, there's a big tradition of requesting teachings and i think it does something really helpful for our minds if we've asked for a specific teaching we listen a lot more deeply than when we actually receive it i think i think that that even even requesting the, the teaching is a matter of uh, karmic ribing, seeds of karmic ribing, because because the differences between the the in general teacher in general and Bud Buddhism teachers that there you need to study in order to become a teacher, but here you should go through the path, and I think that your path is determining if you request teaching or not. If you are in a place of to be taught or to request teaching or to ask for teaching. So you can't suggest it arbitrary. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a good point. You need a, a certain level of development before you even know what to ask. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, it's a sign of spiritual maturity to stop putting all the responsibility on the teacher. You just teach me whatever. I'll listen to whatever you say. Just do the, do the thing. <laughs> and you actually take responsibility and think, actually, given my level of development, given my level of understanding, I need more on this subject. Please, would you teach that subject? You know, it's, it's a kind of a shift in your... Um, personal accountability, responsibility, maturity, these sorts of things to actually know what to ask or know to ask. Um, and I know personally when a, when a Dharma Center asks for a specific topic or a specific teaching, I'm so much happier than if they make me just make it up because it's like, you know yourselves better than I know you. <laughs> what do you need, you know? So um, it can be helpful in that way. But it, it's, it is a series of maturation, you know, because it takes a long time for a student to know what even to request. Yeah. Yeah, Arya, did you have something? Yes, a point out that it, discussing uh, uh, cohesion uh, terminology, terminology of self, uh, idealizing self object uh, state of mind, uh, which is a mature narcissistic, uh, when it, it's more uh, matures and uh, when asking for being taught, uh, it's taking responsibility. It's a state of mind. Uh, also uh, with the teacher or to see somebody else, it's not only, it's, of course, it's in now we're talking about Dharmic, uh, in, about the path, but thinking about it, about uh, being in such a stance in the world, seeing the other as my teacher, anybody, a, a source of teaching. Yeah, yeah, it's very Zen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, you know, I think we have a general sense of this. We've talked about it a lot. Um, it's just something to, to keep coming back to because, you know, you're going to finish a seven year program that gives you a certain kind of authority in this world. You know, you've studied Buddhism for seven years, whether you're Buddhist or not, people are going to expect certain things and you don't have to take that on board. But it's, it's also not fair to say, I don't know anything because you do. You know, and people might ask you things about Buddhism and it's actually against the Bodhisattva path to not teach if you're able to and you're requested. So if it's something you do know something about and people want to hear it, you know, if we want to kind of live up to this Bodhisattva ideal, we do need to explain it as best we can and then refer them to sources that are more advanced than what we're able to connect with. And say, here's my section of knowledge on that. For more, see this book. Or for more, see this teacher. So it's it's also a little bit of, we don't want to have false humility or false modesty that says, oh, I'm a beginner, I'm a beginner. It's like, of course, we're a beginner. We're all beginners. We'll be beginners for, I don't know, a hundred more lifetimes. 
And there are also people that can benefit from what we do know. And so don't have that false modesty or false humility that says, no, no, I don't know anything when you do. So it's a delicate balance. It's a delicate balance. Of course, people are often too quick to teach before they know. But I think that I think that all of you know enough to know what you don't know. <laughs> I think, I think, right? And so you're in less danger, perhaps. Okay, so that's that. And then we get into the sequence in which the disciples are to be taught the actual instructions, the root of the path, devotion to a spiritual guide. So here we are. And um, in order to go more deeply into this section, um, I just wanted to tell you your recommended reading for the week. So um, in your practicing the path, um, practicing the path, I'm just looking at the page number, excuse me, on page 49. So on page 49, there is a section that starts the manner of relying on the spiritual teacher. So if you want to read pages 49 to 56 for next week, 49 to 56 in practicing the path. This is talking about um, the nine attitudes that a sincere practitioner tries to develop in relationship to their teacher. And these nine attitudes are very confronting. So I'm going to um, walk you through them from the traditional prayer we use because it's a lot shorter. And then you can read about it after the fact to kind of like reinforce it and nurture the conversation using the commentary from Young Z Rinpoche. So the nine attitudes that were to develop in order to come closer to kind of merging with the guru, becoming one with the guru, it sounds very subservient. You know, it sounds very um, almost humiliating, almost like you're a slave, almost like you have no independence. And that's, of course, not what's being said, but that's how it sounds. Okay, so I'm just going to, I'll read you the prayer so you get a sense of what I'm talking about, and then we'll unpack it a little bit. So here's Vajajara, who is the tantric emanation of Shakyamuni Buddha. And we have practicing the guru with nine attitudes. So I'm requesting the kind root guru, who is more extraordinary than all the Buddhas. Please bless me to be able to devote myself to the qualified Lord Guru with great respect in all my future lifetimes. So the guru is seen as more kind, more extraordinary, more amazing than all the Buddhas, because that's where you actually access the Dharma through. You know, the Buddha is not obvious in front of us because we don't have the karma to see. And Shakyamuni Buddha or a complete full emanation body is not kind of available and visible in this day and age. So our access to the Dharma is through the teacher, which is why they're more extraordinary than all the Buddhas. So we think that, and it helps you generate respect. So by re realizing that, correctly devoting myself to the kind Lord Guru, who is the foundation of all good qualities, is the root of happiness and goodness, I shall devote myself to him with great respect, not forsaking him even at the cost of my life. So not giving up your devotion, even if it costs you your life, of course, devotion is an inner thing, not an outer thing. But you kind of trace back the verse and you see this idea of it's the root of happiness, the foundation of all good qualities. And we're not necessarily talking about an individual person. We're talking about the fact that everything you're able to do in life was learned. You know, that you were taught how to have kindness, how to read, how to write, how to walk, how to talk, how to eat, how to drink, all of the things that we need to do in order to develop. We were taught by this kind of guru energy. And there's a tradition in Buddhism of when you're thinking about all of your teachers, you even think of the teacher who taught you the alphabet. You even think of the teacher that helped you tie your shoes. You know, you think of all your teachers because they're all this essence of guru-ness and they are the foundation of all of your higher qualities. So thinking of the importance of the qualified guru, may I allow myself to enter under his control. 
may I be like an obedient son, acting exactly in accordance with the Guru's advice. Even when Maras, evil friends and the like, try to split me from the Guru, may I be like a Vajra, inseparable forever. When the Guru gives me work, whatever the burden, may I be like the earth, carrying all. When I devote myself to the Guru, <clears throat> whatever suffering occurs, may I be like a mountain, immovable. Even if I have to perform all the unpleasant tasks, may I be like a servant of the king with a mind undisturbed. May I abandon pride, holding myself lower than the guru. May I be like a sweeper. May I be like a rope, joyfully holding the guru's work, no matter how difficult or heavy a burden. Even when the guru criticizes, provokes, or ignores me, may I be like a dog without anger, never responding with anger. May I be like a ferry boat, never upset at any time to come and go for the guru. O glorious and precious root guru, please bless me to be able to practice in this way. From now on, in all my future lifetimes, may I be able to devote myself to the guru in this way. By reciting these words aloud and reflecting on their meaning in your mind, you will have the good fortune to be able to devote yourself correctly to the precious guru from life to life in all your future lifetimes. If you offer service and respect and make offerings to the precious guru with these nine attitudes, even if you do not practice intentionally, you will develop many good qualities, collect extensive merit and quickly achieve full enlightenment. Okay, so that's pretty epic, right? Like, may I be like a servant, may I be like a sweeper, may I be like a rope, may I, be, you know, it's, it's full on, like, they're not messing around with the devotion here. And this is a prayer that someone like, you know, Lama Zopa Rinpoche would have us recite often. And the first time I heard it, I was really disturbed. I thought, this sounds like a cult. This sounds like the worst idea possible. This sounds like giving up self-determination. I'm grossed out. I want to run away. Where is the logical Buddhism that I know and love? Yuck. Okay, so that's what I thought the first time I read that prayer. And possibly um, you guys have more, I don't know, flexibility of mind and more a spacious attitude and you're not as reactive as I was the first time I heard it when I was, you know, 19 or whatever. But it took a long time before I came to actually even love this prayer. And I think that in order to understand what it's getting at, we have to remember what it's like to be joyfully in service of something bigger than ourselves. Yeah, to joyfully be in service. So in Tibetan, and I forget how it's said in Tibetan, but there's this concept of having a light bum, meaning that you're really ready to jump up off your seat. You know, you have a light bum, you don't have a heavy bum. You know, you're ready to, you know, get off your meditation cushion. You're ready to get out of your classroom seat. You're able to leap to the aid. Whenever the guru like snaps his fingers and says, I need this snap and you just jump up without even thinking, the, having a light bum, which on the surface can sound really um, hierarchical, you know, like a hierarchy, it can seem, like, um, I don't know, kind of a feudal system. It can sound pretty like, why would you do that? And the thing is, is that when you actually do it from a place of deep self-confidence, that this person that you're relying on is basically just the representative of your potential fully developed, then you have this kind of joyful leaping into service, almost delighted, to leave your ego behind for a moment, you know? And it's, it's hard to explain, but maybe some of you have this experience. You know, I know that um, if, if I've, uh, the few times I've been able to offer service at one of his holiness's public teachings, if he turns and says, I need that thing there on that table, I am like so happy to get up and give it to him. I'm so happy, I can't even tell you. I'm just, it's like a bliss bomb. Yeah. And, you know, the same is true um, if my own teacher says, Oi, Yinden, close the window, you know, something really basic. 
you know, and I, I, oh, okay, I'll close the window. Get up, close the window. I'm so happy, you know, and then I sit down and I'm like, what is wrong with me? Like, why was that great? Like, am I just like a teenage girl with a rock band and the rock star has said, do this, jump that. And, I, and I'm all giggly and like, oh, yay, I get to help the famous person. You know, is it something so basic as that? You know, and I question my own responses and ask, why am I so delighted? But what I realize is that it's, it kind of pulls you out of having to be in a way in charge of everything driven by your ego. It's, it's a relief to, I guess it's a relief to not be in charge. It's a relief to not have to have all the answers or know what to do while still knowing that those are there. But the way to do this accurately, you have to have such a deep confidence in your own ability to, I guess, for lack of a better word, excuse my swearing, but you're, you need to have confidence in your ability to notice bullshit. Yeah. And if you have that deep confidence that can see when something is not dharmic and is not the path, then you joyfully do whatever the guru asks because you know yourself and you know your wisdom deeply enough that you won't be pulled into doing something non-virtuous or something that is out of sync with the path. Does it make sense? So it's like, they're like the mouthpiece for all the things you already want to do. So you're adopting this, this kind of servant attitude from a place of deep self-awareness and a place of deep self-confidence and having humility with that kind of self-confidence is very healthy and efficient on the spiritual path. Having humility without self-confidence, that's when you get into danger. That's when it becomes cultish and that's when it becomes negative types of, you know, projection and transference. That's when it gets really weird. And of course you will see that in Dharma centers. You'll see people who are just like, oh, whatever Rinpoche says, whatever Rinpoche says, in a kind of like a little bit giving up autonomy or giving up responsibility weird way, you know, almost like a form of laziness where it's like, Life is hard. Decisions are hard. Please just decide for me. I give you all the power. It's too hard to deal with my own life. You do it. You know, and a lot of people have that kind of need and hopefully they find someone who doesn't abuse that and eventually they mature into this healthier version, which is basically the guru is the words of their own inner wisdom. Am I, am I making sense or is it, am I, yeah, do, do you know what I'm talking about? This, this way of having confident humility and why that's efficient on the path? And, you know, it says right in the, the teachings, if the guru asks you to do something unethical, you just say no, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, and you say it respectfully, but you're just like, no. Nope. <laughs> and that's what's difficult because you might, um, especially in the West, especially with kind of modern Buddhism, you find teachers who have crazy wisdom, like um, Chogyam Trimpa Rinpoche, who displayed some aspects that were questionable. Like he showed the aspect of being an alcoholic and being a womanizer and being kind of authoritarian and having kind of anger issues. And then you read his teachings. Like if you read Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism, it's one of the most brilliant, eloquent texts about Dharma that you could ever read. It's amazing. But he was confusing. <laughs> And for, for his disciples, he was the perfect one for them because he kind of showed a transformed aspect of a lot of their trauma. You know, a lot of them were children of alcoholics. A lot of them were abuse survivors. A lot of them had all of this kind of really interesting background, which meant that when they met him 
and he showed these aspects, there was something in them that felt familiarity and comfort, even though it was with things that were not healthy. And then having met them there, he could kind of evolve them into something better than that. But for some people, it was absolutely the wrong thing and he was the wrong teacher for them and it was very damaging. So it's like the teacher theoretically needs to have perfect ethics, but for some people, that's not even the right way. For some people, they need a crazy aspect that's completely against the Dharma to remind them of the Dharma. So you start to see that despite guru devotion being the beginning of the path, it's incredibly advanced practice because you need such deep self-awareness. You have to know yourself so well and have some sort of trust in your own ability to hear wisdom and to hear a flawed presentation and to know it to be a flawed presentation. You know, it really, it takes a very stable mind to handle guru devotion because the longer you spend with someone, the more you see of their little ways, you know, their little kind of idiosyncrasies or their little kind of less than perfect behaviors. And to be able to frame that in such a way that it's consistently a teaching for you without doing mental gymnastics that turn you into a fundamentalist is hard. Right. So you can see how very easy it is to go down the wrong road and become a fundamentalist and take everything so literally. And yet the teaching is literally see the teacher as the Buddha once you're going into the Mahayana path. For the Pali tradition, you can just see them as a representative of the Buddha. But in the Mahayana path, particularly Tantra, they are the Buddha. And that's delicate. But Yuntan, could you say something else concerning what you were describing now in, in being like serving the teacher, which is probably something beyond, I'm not getting it, but so that's why I'm asking because uh, being helpful to someone, uh, you know, out of politeness, out of compassion, out of want to be positive, you know, etc., and your natural openness to someone that you are it's not admiring it's even it's it's a different level of uh, i think uh, looking up to something it's more than it's a kind of idealized self object but a higher level of one like this so but this uh, tendency to to be a, to be a, on the deep level of as a servant has something else probably than just being positive towards your teacher or your guru or your buddha so could you say something about it that takes it to a different uh, register, how to say, you know, of, of matter of events, I don't know. You know, it's, it's something that, it is hard to put into words, but it is a difference between, you know, if you're on a aspirationally bodhisattva practice, you like to help people. You know, so if they say, I'm hungry, you're happy to feed them. It makes you happy. You know, if someone is in distress, it makes you happy to help them. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about devotion. You know, devotion is like, you don't need any help, but you're asking me for help. You know, the Buddhas don't need any help. They're fine, right? The gurus don't need any help. They're fine. It's just like the offerings on the altar. It's not like the Buddhas need our flowers. They don't need flowers and water and whatever. The gurus do not need our devotion. And for the most part, they will probably show the aspect of not even wanting it or liking it. They might kind of brush it aside. But what happens is that, like, for example, um, when I lived at the nunnery at Chenrezig, my teacher, um, Ken Rinpoche, he would go to Brisbane once a week and teach at the city center. And when he went away to the city center, that was the only time he left the house, really, for any long period of time. So like five of us would go and clean his house. Yeah. And we would not just clean his house in an ordinary way. We would be like down on our hands and knees, like scrubbing, 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 scrubbing. And I remember one day I was on my hands and knees scrubbing the kitchen floor and scrubbing and scrubbing. And I could just almost picture 
my my mother who is you know like die hard old school feminist seeing me scrub the floor of my teacher and she would be like what is going on here and she would have been like i did not raise my daughter to scrub anyone's floor you know and i could just hear her voice in my head just like oh my god what are you doing and you know and i was kind of laughing at myself and laughing at how odd this must look you know, that I, this, you know, strong, empowered sort of um, feminist woman would just happily be on my hands and knees doing this domestic task for this man, right? And I was so happy. I was so happy they asked me to scrub his floor. And then one day they're like, why don't you do his bathroom? And I was like, oh, I get to do his bathroom? Oh, this is wonderful. And the the joy of almost in a way merging with my own ideal through service meant that the next day in class was often my most open day in class. The next day in class, whatever he was teaching, I often heard far more deeply and clearly than the rest of the week. It's in a way cleared the obstacles, cleared the negative karma, cleared the blockages to my own development. And whether that, you know, it's a psychological exercise or a karmic exercise, the fundamental premise is that you become receptive to what you respect. You become receptive to what you respect. You become open to what you devote to. So you better pick someone who is worthy of your devotion and who is safe to devote to, you know, and that's an examination that requires a lot of deep thought. But once you do that, once you've checked them out and you see that they won't take advantage of you, that they're not coming at this from a weird place, that their ethics are stable and that their appearance in terms of their behavior works for your personality. Once you've kind of done that assessment, then when you offer service in this way, it is such a joyful cleansing to prepare the mind to hear very, very deeply. So it sounds weird and it still sounds weird even as I'm saying it out loud. I know how it sounds <laughs> and it sounds weird, but it does work and that's what's fascinating. And you just can't have this mind that thinks I am lower, therefore nothing, therefore bad. You know, this is a very confident humility. So just keep hearing confident humility. I don't know if that helps flesh it out, but de devotion is a, is a much different act of service than it is to peers or people who are more vulnerable, which is also blissful, which is also a joyful kind of merging, which is also very important. And eventually all acts of service take on that aspect of both seeing the vulnerable as your teacher and your guru that you raise up high, as well as suffering sentient beings that you want to end their suffering. You know, and that kind of parallel paradoxical idea that every, everyone is your suffering mother and everyone is your high teacher simultaneously. But it kind of has to start with one relationship that has a literal higher feeling. And then you can kind of spread it. So when, when Lama Zopa Rinpoche talks about the guru, he he goes into, you know, then think every statue, every stupa, every text is the guru. Then think every ant and every, you know, kangaroo and every blah, blah, blah is the guru. Until eventually everything is the guru that you're adopting this service attitude towards with an elevated attitude. But it has to start with kind of one person. Yeah. All right. Very much what uh, Langri Tangpa eight verses is describing in the, the second uh, verse to be the lowest of all. It is alive uh, practicing with uh, our uh, with my eye cherishing or my self cherishing uh, as the center. Uh, not negating the, this inherent I to be the lowest to, to practice it. And it's so um, 
and not on it, it's not a describing of a masochistic stance, but the opposite, uh, like in a very mature, more and more and more mature state of mind, being happy without any different, um, anything that is a, a wall between me and my, my guru, and, but a, a wall between me and uh, anyone also. To, Practicing being a, a wholeness, sweeping the, the floor of uh, of your teacher, the, uh, cleaning the, the floor. Yeah, it's, I can imagine. I mean, it, it's, it, a I, it's similar to the eight verses, but it's it's a slightly different angle. It it is very similar. You're right, but but there's this slightly different angle, and and I'm trying to think of the best way to describe it so that it makes sense, but. It's, it's a little bit like, okay, we take a step back. So, you know, when you're practicing compassion, the definition of compassion is wishing sentient beings to be free from suffering. So sometimes you're looking at freedom from suffering as possible. Sometimes you're looking at suffering as happening right now. So sometimes you're meeting their suffering and sometimes you're meeting their potential. And then as you develop compassion, you bring both awareness of suffering and awareness of potential simultaneously together in the moment, mm -hmm. right? When we're practicing compassion. With the guru, it's a little bit like we start with potentiality and we're merging with potentiality and mm -hmm. we're coming closer to our own potential and seeing that it is true and possible and an elevated state beyond what we've experienced so far. And just that potentiality side. Mm. And then we look you know, across and down at sentient beings who are our peers or who are more vulnerable and fragile than ourselves and see that they have the Buddhist seed as well. They have that potential that we have. They have that potential that's been actualized in our guru. And so then we start to meet and touch their inner guru and honor their inner guru while still acknowledging that they have not finished the path yet, at least in terms of our appearance of them. So they may have finished the path and they're just kind of showing the aspect of being an ordinary person with irritability and neuroses or whatever. But we're kind of acknowledging that we can elevate people even if they're not elevated because they have Buddha potential. You know, and so seeing yourself as the lowest of all in terms of the eight verses is a way to stop being competitive. And it's a way to make people feel safe with you. Whereas elevating the guru and seeing yourself lower than the guru is a way for you to look up and see where you're going and to come closer to it. Do you, do you feel the distinction? And then eventually they kind of all come together and you're seeing everyone as the guru, sure. But um, it's, you know, it's kind of progressive. Look, it's a, it's a confronting thing to be subordinate. You know, it's a, it's a confronting thing to prostrate, you know, in a retreat, you know, you throw yourself on the ground all the way down, face in the dirt again and again, up and down, up and down in these retreats, um, purifying your negative karma of body, speech, and mind by really consciously acknowledging, I have made mistakes that I regret. And I am owning that with honesty and transparency before the eyes of great compassion. And I'm not going to kind of stand eye to eye and say, I made mistakes, but you made mistakes too. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, of course, the Buddhas were once ordinary beings who once made mistakes, but we're not kind of viewing it in that way. We're kind of moving towards transcendence. So it's almost like in the act of prostration, in the act of subordinate, in the act of kind of giving and showing respect, we're opening and opening and opening to more and more tools that can transform us. But if, if we're sort of not in that deep, deep listening for truth mode, we never tr evolve. 
so it's difficult, you know, if you're a relatively self-aware, relatively intelligent person with relatively good mental health to think I am a sick person and they are the doctor. It's tricky, you know, without going down a wrong road with it. But you almost are saying I'm healthy enough to see how I'm sick. If I was really, really sick, I wouldn't even know how sick I was but I'm healthy enough to see myself clearly and to kind of move towards, I could use some back. But you have enough faith in yourself that you can hear good advice and put aside bad advice or advice that doesn't work for you at your level yet. So this inner guru, outer guru bridge, this inner and outer conversation, this gateway that we're trying to build, this is the essence of guru devotion. Yeah, is it's not a completely one-sided thing or a completely outward focusing thing. It's a back and forth conversation. It's a collaboration or like a meeting of minds. How is it landing? I, those nine attitudes, they're really full on, you know, they're not, you can't kind of pretend that it's other than it is. It's, it's subordinate, you know, but what is the benefit of that from a place of, you know, good mental health? What's the benefit of adopting that attitude? that really subdues your pride. What I understand from your emphasis is not the relationship of two, of a disciple and a guru, but more of an opening of the mind to the Dharma. It's a gate to the Dharma, so a holy being. But it's not the relationship sweeping the floor of a specific person. It's, it, it is through that, but it is a gate to cultivating more and more of the wisdom of the Dharma. It's not the emphasis on the relationship and being uh, uh, someone's slave or something. It's many um, um, things that we can do uh, for the guru, but it's not the, the, I feel it's not the act itself. It's, it's, it's uh, the openness to the mind, to, to uh, his wisdom. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, whatever gets you there, but I think in Tibetan Buddhism, we have such a strong emphasis in using all of the senses, you know, not just not just the mental sense power, but, you know, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, everything. And so, you know, you have a physical act of respect, you have a verbal act of respect, you're visualizing things to respect, you're thinking deeply about this. And it's, again, bringing your senses into your own control and making them work for your path rather than against your path. And so physical acts of service, for example, of course only work if there's a mental tie-in, you know, if you're just scrubbing the floors because the floors need to be clean, you know, that's not really the point. <laughs> you know, that's more a bonus or a side effect. Oh good, now there's clean floors. You know, the main thing is about the mental training. And what does it do to say, I will scrub his floor more immaculately and thoroughly and with more detail than I would scrub my own? You know, what does that do to my mind and my mental experience? So when you see these big llamas come to town, you'll, you'll see a lot of these behaviors of devotion and some people understand what they're doing while they're doing it. And some people are just going through the motions, but if you're called upon to offer service in this way know that there's a psychology underneath it that's very useful i have a question i don't know if it's now or if we had a discussion in the class earlier about uh, two types of psychology one that sees one person psychology or two person psychology uh, more intersubjective how would you describe the relationship with the guru is uh, the quality of the relationship? Well, you know, I don't have the background on what you guys were, were talking about, but, um, you know, my relationship with my own teacher is really a relationship with myself, you know, and uh, more and more as time goes by, if I literally directly, you know, send him a voice message and say, hi, Rimshe, I'm wondering, should I do this or should I do that? He will say, you choosing, you grown up, you old nun, you know? Um, but in the beginning, he might've said, do this practice first, do this practice second. I think for you, it'd be good to pace things in this way. You know, 
15 years ago, I don't know, whatever, he would have said more specifically hand holding, you know, kind of spoon feeding. And then, you know, as time goes by, when I ask him advice, he's like, I already explained this, <laughs> you know, basically it's your life, you know? And so it's like, it's almost a paradox. It's like, you're completely subservient in the sense of whatever you say, but at the same time, it's like, I can only do whatever I can hear, <laughs> you know? So the guru is not going to say, usually, you know, some gurus do, but usually the guru is not going to be so pinpointed specific to you handholding. They're going to teach a general audience the teachings and you have to hear it as personal advice. And that's your job as an individual. The responsibility is all on your shoulders. You've got support though. You know, that's the thing. You're flooded with support. You're held, you know, you're cherished, you're loved, but you have to figure out how to digest that and who you can hear it from. So, yeah, so I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of people who just want their teacher to tell them what to do. And then when their teacher tells them what to do, they say, oh, never mind, I'll do what I want. And that becomes problematic. Ramon, did you have something? Just to say concerning the Smadar's uh, question, uh, you could hear uh, earlier when Yuntan said, becoming one with your guru. And we used to speak not about the difference between one person psychology to two person psychology, but to the third phase of psychoanalysis in our mind, psychology of oneness. It's not a psychology of relationship, as you mentioned earlier, Smada. And what uh, Yunten is uh, uh, summarizing, it's, it's a relation with me. In, in a sense, becoming one with your guru is becoming without, becoming myself without any vertical space in myself. That's something which is uh, really, you can call enlightenment. But the term one-person psychology and two-person psychology, we uh, in, we enlarge it and broaden it to to the third phase of psychology of oneness. Yeah, it reminds me of um, you know when Ken Rinpoche, Geshe Chachi Sering, when my teacher got Australian citizenship, they had a ceremony, you know, and you do whatever vows or whatever, and in the Australian ceremony it says blah 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 under God, and then they stopped and they're like, oh, you're Buddhist though, you do you believe in God? I uh, the, uh, and and he said, under God no problem, under the afflictions this is the main problem. Right. And so, you know, what this group devotion stuff is about is that right now we already are subordinate and subservient to our negative states of mind. Yeah. Like who is bossing us around? We think I'm bossing myself around. No, we're being controlled by our disturbing emotions. So you're giving your authority to your quote, higher self to use new agey terms, but you know, you're, you're shifting the authority from your delusions to your qualities to your developmental processes and the things that represent that for you. So it's not like you don't have any authoritarian dictatorship inside of you, you do, it's the delusions. So anyway, it's a swapping of authority from the delusions to your Buddha nature, to the actualized form of your Buddha nature in the form of this person that you've met and then gradually you kind of integrate with, so. Um, so before I forget, there's this really interesting book. Um, if you ever want to do a Lam Rim retreat by yourself and you need a bit of um, guidance, this book is called um, Heart Advice for Retreat, and it's by Pabonka Rinpoche and Lama Zopa Rinpoche. And it goes through all the Lam Rim topics and how you would meditate on them, kind of how long you would meditate on them and what to focus on as well as kind of like the things to look for in terms of your own realizations. So this book, I anyway, I just found it in my bookshelf the other day and was rereading it and remembering how awesome it is. So I put the title in the chat section. 
that hard advice for retreat. So, you know, you would turn to the guru devotion section and go, oh, okay, I'm going to think of this, this, and this until this and this sign happens. And it's, it's useful to kind of be able to gauge your progress. So like that. Okay, so we'll, um, we'll dedicate and um, have a read through of that section on the nine um, attitudes in your commentary. So all of the energy of these thoughts and conversations, may they go to these aims. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow. May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. Okay, I'll see you for meditation later on. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Yansu.